Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode number six of our Nameless Podcast. <laughs> AJ's been giving me a hard time <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Harry with Zeros Geckos on Instagram, um, uh, co-hosted with AJ at AJD Reptiles, also on Instagram and everywhere else. And uh, today we're uh, blessed and honored to have um, Noan Meredith from Oklahoma Zoological. And uh, yeah, we're super excited to have you guys um, to chat and talk and uh, talk about geckos as a yeah. hobby and business side of things. And um, and yeah, excited to get into the weeds of things. So <laughs> um, welcome, uh, Noah and Meredith. How are you guys doing? How's everything going? We're good. We're really honored to be here. We heard about yeah. your podcast. Then we'll listen to a bunch of the episodes. I told you about the podcast. You told me about the podcast. <laughs> you said it's pretty great. So we're really excited to be here and get to talk geckos with some more gecko nerds. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Where were you guys born and raised? Um, where do you live currently? Other hobbies that you guys have? What's a, Give us a snapshot of who you guys are. So I, I was born in Shreveport. I've been I've been in the gecko hobby for like 15 years now, since 2007 wow. or so. Okay. Um, I've, I've always been doing it, really. I've, I've been doing the geckos longer than... I've not been doing them, so. <laughs> and you, Mayor? Uh, I was born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's where we currently live, um, is Tulsa. Um, I didn't actually get into geckos, and I started with leopard geckos, but I didn't get into geckos, like owning them until 2013. But I loved geckos and reptiles ever since I was a tiny, tiny little thing. Um, I just, I had, my parents were terrified. My mom was terrified of snakes, terrified of reptiles. So I just never got to have them until I got old enough and had my own money and my own place to be. And I just got into them, got into the Cresties and fell in love with them. So I've been doing that, you know, mm. ever since. Yeah, that's awesome. You guys have um, a lot of other hobbies besides geckos? Not really. <laughs> oh, you do art. You do art, You're right? just living the gecko life 24 yeah, seven. Really. Um, so, so I actually, I grew up riding horses. So that's a hobby oh, that's okay. been on pause for several years since, you know, college and it's very expensive. Um, I also, I mean, I play D and D. Uh, we right. like to do yeah. trivia. Um, I show, I show uh, my dog. I have a German shepherd that I'd show confirmation mm. with. And, um, other than that, we don't have much else. But you play disc I mean, golf. I, I play disc golf, yeah. and I oh, oh they represent. So they do love disc golf. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean, he does all his golfer. painting. Also, we have plants. Yes, we mm. do a lot of plants. These are just a few of the plants behind us that we've got, but we have a bunch more throughout gecko cages and gecko and rooms, gecko rooms, kitchens. <laughs> They're all <laughs> everywhere. over the place. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's and, like at my house too. I've got them everywhere nice. as well. So. <laughs> um, and AJ, you 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 guys been you guys have both been around for a long time. So have you guys known each other for a long time as well? Yeah, we've definitely uh, definitely run in the same uh, circles. But we uh, I don't. When was the first time we met, Noah? Maybe like not that long ago, like five years ago, maybe. I officially met you at the 2019 October Tumley. Um, okay. I, I remember talking to you in probably 2013 or 14 on Pangea, okay. I think. Yeah. And I've been... That would have been right before Facebook really kind of yes. like reptile yeah. pages. On, I think reptile pages on Facebook maybe kind of started in like 2012, 2013. Right. Um, where you could have a business page on Facebook. Um, but yeah, Pangea forms, man. That's uh, I liked your post the other day on a... A side note, or were you were you talking about who posted that? Was that you? The old morph about like country. the old school morphs. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. That was uh, that was interesting to to see and hear people's memory of kind of Pangea forums and back in the day, kind of what the morphs were that people talked about and the infamous kind of things that people claimed but weren't real and right. And, it was just funny, a blast from the past to think about that stuff. Like you were talking about chevrons. I don't, I, that's not one that I really remember. I have not heard the chevron trait be mentioned in probably five or six years. 
What even is it? What like it, it's isn't not... it just tiger? Isn't it just like a Harley with like a broken like lateral or a broken no. um dorsal? It's sort of like a flame with tiger markings like going into the dorsal and making a zipper or zigzag down the dorsum. Okay. So and something that something that nobody really cares about anymore. <laughs> that and it's been bred out of the collections as people breed more towards higher pattern. There, yeah. There's some sort of interaction between the full dorsal coverage and the laterals that yeah. sort of prohibits the, um, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> that, that sort of pro prohibits the weird jagged dorsum. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, as people have moved towards higher coverage animals, those animals just kind of disappeared through, right. through increased coverage being bred on the animals. <laughs> That makes sense. I yeah. haven't, uh, yeah, I haven't seen one in a long time. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like I may have seen mention of them when well, I started, but like we, we hatched that one out of zebra cake and uh, birthday cake. I no zebra cake and Ewok. Mm -hmm. That was a classical chevron, mm -hmm. but but it wound up dripping and it covered all of the jagged edges <laughs> so not so chevron after <laughs> right that. <laughs> that's funny so you know kind of getting uh into your guys's uh just the reptiles and the geckos and everything how did you both land in the hobby of reptiles i'm curious it sounds like meredith you were interested from a young age but your mom was not noah what was your kind of your start i want to hear both of you kind of like oh. what was your first animal what kind of made you catch the bug? When I was four, my parents got me a firebelly toad. Oh, that's actually, I think those are awesome. Oh, I love them. I, They're I awesome. I Have you seen that guy that breeds like the blue and yes. like crazy ones? <laughs> I want those so bad. But <laughs> So it's... from there, <laughs> I wound up getting a leopard gecko that I named Leppy. Nice. Lappy. I love that name. <laughs> but it, it was like 2001, 2002 or so. So people were not well educated. Leppy and the Firebelly Toad, which was named Firebelly, wound up uh, being for the original. Um, I had a bird named Birdie. <laughs> I, I had a lot of really bad names. I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so you co-housed the leopard and the toad yeah i i was five don't kill me um <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna cancel you for this <laughs> co-housing <laughs> well like like even now i see that as being a like like one of the reasons that we're trying to educate further in better husbandry um mm -hmm. That, that sort of information is so much more widely present now. And mm -hmm. like, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I completely butchered that. We'll trim that. Um, <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. You're good, man. Um, you're good. Cut it, cut it. <laughs> but it's stuff like that that, I mean, basically there was an access. What you're saying is there right. was an access. They, they both back eat then. crickets. Um. And, and <laughs> they're birds. And so, but he was, you know, he was five years old. His parents didn't know how to research either. And so that yeah, was that's fair. a thing that needed to happen. But it was also. They both lived forever. It was, so it was also 21 <laughs> so years good, ago. Yeah. Because he's yeah, 26 yeah. now. So, you know, husbandry has improved a lot. Knowledge has improved a lot. So we're out here trying to do it with him, too. I'm actually amazed that they did well together. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, I'm sure they would have lived a lot longer and lived more, adi not adequately, but just better if, if they were yeah. separate. But... <clears throat> so you got, they made so it. you got the fire belly toad, you got the leopard gecko, what was the first, what got you in the Crested Geckos? So like at, the... at my local Petco, they got a Crested Gecko in at around 2004, 2005. And I held it and I 
I knew that I had to have one one day. Mm. So 2007 rolls around. We went to the NERBC Arlington for my birthday because it coincides with my birthday. Yeah. So, um, wow. And I wound that, up picking up a awesome. leopard, a, a crested gecko. <laughs> that's awesome. So, uh, what was the the morph of your first crested gecko you got? <laughs> it was the world's most average flame. <laughs> What did you name it? Flame. <laughs> Stop. Its name was Flame. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, well, it was I wanted badass name. I wanted it to be Flamey. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's just got a Y on the end of it. Yeah. Well, his fat tailed gecko was Affy. And Leppy. And Leppy. Leppy. And, <laughs> and Cresty. Yeah, I'm sure you had a Cresty. Cresty oh, the no. Crested. <laughs> oh man. Okay, so you got one, and then what's the what's the where did you you know kind of go down the the rabbit trail of getting many? In two thousand eight, I wound up buying a male female pair from Petco. I I bought a whole ton of stuff from Petco back in the day, um, and I, that was kind of one of the only places you could buy them. Yeah, for sure. Like they're, they're like really- my local show had zero. Zero there, crusty. There were no local breeders. The closest show was in inter- in ARBC Arlington. Like that wow. that was simply the climate of the hobby back then. Yeah. So I, I bought that pair. The Petco people said that I could keep them together. I kept them together. I got babies. It, it's the classic story of mm-hmm. starting out. But then I wound up selling them and I used that money to set up a the Varian forum and it it all just kept snowballing. I I would make money, I would put more money in into it. I would make a bit more money. I would put more money into it, and so on. <laughs> and here we are now. Yeah. <laughs> and what about you, Meredith? What was your? I know you you like leopard geckos. You still keep some leopard geckos. Yeah. But so. did you <laughs> ever did you ever buy? Did, were you ever doing crested geckos? Yeah. Like so, earlier um, on. I actually did start with Cresteds before I met Noah. Cresteds is how I even connected with Noah. Um, I actually, my story is kind of similar. I was into the leopard geckos. I, there was a leopard gecko that I'd fallen in love with when I was like in second or third grade or third grade. When I moved to a new school, there was a high school teacher that had a leopard gecko. thought it was the coolest thing ever because I'd mostly seen snakes. Um, got to know him over the years because it was a tiny, tiny little school and started with the leopard geckos, but then I was going to local shows and it was actually um, Apex Exotics let me hold one of their animals, like a big male or something. And he had floppy crest. I thought Cresties were the ugliest thing in the world. Let me tell you what, I thought they were hideous um, because I'd only seen ugly ones. And yeah, you mean yellow? That, but also I was- <laughs> Oh, stop, at, like, that hurts. <laughs> I was looking at like Ben Siegel because that's the only place I knew to like find reptiles and like i was just kind of yeah. casually like trying to figure this stuff out and um i held one and i'm like this is the softest thing i've ever felt and i fell in love and started acquiring a few i got some from a local pet store got a few from pseudo local breeders like missouri and texas just like a couple and it just kind of exploded from there yeah so you guys were both you know, your love was brewing brewing from afar as you were both raising these geckos. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's so cool. So as far as, I, you know, I think back to my early days and like, I have I have down to ask this question, but focus, like what what was the thing that, that maybe kind of captivated your mind or, you know, when you were breeding, was it just, let's just put random ones together and see what pops out. Or did you have some, did you see an animal on the forums where like, I want to make one so, of those? At the 2010 in ARBC Arlington, I I was vending with Berry Patch Geckos. I'm not sure if you remember them from the- I remember the name. Days. Yeah, I remember the name. Well, they had, they had a whole ton of really nice yellow and orange based animals. There was okay. Quidditch, there was Radar. A lot of these animals still have offspring out there today. Hmm. And 
I, I saw them in person and my mind was blown by them. I picked up a Quidditch coconut kid and a Quidditch, I think, banana kid. I'm, I'm not entirely positive now because I sold her eventually. Um, and that, that was my obsession and it still remains my obsession. I, I love the yellow pattern. I love the fingers of white going up the laterals and I, I was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> so yellows caught you. What about you, Meredith? What was kind of your thing that interested you? Um, I kind of had wide variety of taste. that did not much like yellows. Sorry, Noah. <laughs> I, and I still don't much like yellows, but I saw reds. Honestly, I saw caviar, his gecko, and I loved that thing. Mm. Um, Halloween's really, really bright pinstripes with empty back. I kind of had a really wide variety of taste. I was not you, super. You focused. really liked the quad stripes, and I loved like, quad um, stripes, super and, stripes. Uh huh. And reds captured me pretty quickly. So and darks too, but like reds. Are... She is the only reason we still have reds. <laughs> So. <laughs> I hear that. I, uh, I struggle with. I, I struggle with keeping them too. <laughs> the uh, so you're breeding. You're breeding animals. So you're working towards these different projects. Um, you know what was what was kind of like the early. I, I'm just curious from like uh, an early collection standpoint. This is kind of veering off track, but I'm interested in how like how your care has evolved. Did you start with like or, glass tanks yeah. <laughs> or, or bins and then move to like, I know kind of where you're at now, but I'm, I'm it's interested. It's a whole in rabbit kinda... hole. So I started yeah. using yeah. the like 20 breeder. No, not, not the 20 breeder, the, the 20, 20 tells. Tells. Um, I, I never turned them on their end. I, I thought it was done then. I still think it's done now. Like it only yeah. has, like, four or six inches of height like <laughs> come on yeah um yeah i did keep like three females per 20 gallon <laughs> for the longest um until 2010 or 11 then i trimmed it down to two females per 20 gallon then in 2013 i trimmed it down to a single female per 20 gallon wow yeah <laughs> that that's nice of you <laughs> oh yeah i i feel like i did the absolute best ever so <laughs> um, and then you guys now are using pvc right you're no using... we're using pvc there was a time period between like 2014 and 15 to 2015 was when i got the larger pvc cages um I kept them in 66 quart bins like most everyone else did and does. Mm. Um, I, I just hated not being able to see them. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. With the opaque plastic, just right. not being able to see them as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they do. They work really well. They're really cheap. Right. Um, they're easy to clean, but it's not very um, visually appealing. I will I never know. knock them. Like, they're solid equipment for other breeders. But, yeah. And we use bins for smaller animals and, and, and for yeah. the leopard and geckos and, and snakes. The leopard geckos and... and snakes. But um, we just like the PVC for the adult breeders. Yeah. And you guys, what, was it last year you moved into your place, your new place? Mm -hmm. you all... Well, we, we've moved into a few new places, <laughs> but we finally purchased a house. You and... bought a house, right? Yeah. Yeah, we bought a house in December yeah. and we actually, we had to do some fixing up on the house. There was some nasty carpet. We had to take mm. some... Uh, wood paneling down and um, we actually moved in after the first of the year. Okay. Oh, okay. Sweet. Nice. Yeah. So now that you're, now that you're in the house, what is the size of your breeding collection of mainly crested geckos, but uh, you can say other things like where wait. have you settled into a point where you're comfortable and <laughs> <laughs> that that's a hot topic or what, what's the sweet spot of where you'd like to be maybe where you are now and where you'd like to be. The sweet spot for me would be about 20, well, 14 to 20 crusty breeders. And Females? No, overall. Total? Total. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I really like keeping things small. I like to be able to enjoy them without just getting sucked into hours upon hours upon hours of care, like where I'm at right now. Um, yeah. 
like so we, where are you at right now oh well you know in the midst of hatching season right now anything you say won't uh, scare <laughs> me you have uh, right you're, now, you're preaching to the choir so between the leopard geckos and crested geckos and everything else we're somewhere around like 420 430 wow mm-hmm. it's a lot of animals yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it's a lot <laughs> yeah <laughs> we, did, we did bring in um, Angie Thostrup's Mama T's Cresties collection, and we're sort yeah. of, there's some we're keeping, there's some we're selling and releasing. We're keeping but, five or six. But there was 37 animals we took on all at Plus once. Eggs. Plus eggs. Wow. Plus okay. eggs. That we, and some of them are still laying that we took on all at once, on top of was what we that, were hatching. Was that mainly adults, or was that kind of a mix? A mix. It, it was about one-third adults, one-third, like, 10 to 20 gram animals and the rest were babies. Yeah. Mm, okay. So you trimmed down to about five, five to six. We are, we're working there. We're, okay. we're getting there. I got you. I got you. <laughs> There's only five uh, or six that we're keeping for good. Yeah. So got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's always exciting when you get to add like new blood and especially yeah. stuff that's kind of like old school, like legacy animals like that. I always, it's fun when you get the opportunity to, to kind of put some of that back into maybe it hasn't been bred a couple of years or something and you can kind of right you know right re you know repair them and 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 uh, continue that lineage on so that's yeah. really cool you guys did that when i saw that i was excited yeah one of those was like a, a direct chowder son that was Kavik. in the group Kavik, who's a direct chowder son which is like chowder is usually like way back in the lineage and then yeah. there Wilson, who is Wilson's like, a direct Owen Venus kid. Um, didn't she? Isn't she related to like Calix and Winchester? Winchester and um, wow. there, there's a few others out there. But Angie did the pair in 2012, and then she repeated the pair in 2018. So I have a 2018 Owen Venus kid that I can mm. keep using for the next six to eight years with that's awesome with, without her like losing for fertility or anything yeah so that's a female that you got that's from that yes. whole like winchester calyx yeah. kind of lineage that's awesome are you Yelp. breeding her now or no uh she is currently laying eggs from Kavik, the chowder son um yeah i've got like four different pairings lined up for the next four years for her. like wow so you're you're gonna you're gonna mix things up you're gonna change oh yes here. yes she's That'll going to fun. yellows she's going to reds nice i yeah, gotta see a picture of that perfect. one i don't know if yeah. i've seen her oh yeah, she I'll posted on your si- on your ig video i don't think i posted her okay we need to. yeah we, we really yeah i need, I need like, to see her that would be yeah. awesome she's lovely so so what made you i'm just curious i i mean that makes that makes sense that animal but um was there some maybe purpose behind buying um angie's collection where you were like oh this is really going to help us with this project that we're kind of moving towards was there some kind of vision with that angie had a singular male that i was obsessed with and i decided that I had to have that male, even if it meant adding like 36 other animals <laughs> along with it. Um, <laughs> um, it. <laughs> what color is the animal? Of course, yeah, yellow. But mm-hmm. it's perfect. That's awesome. So you got that animal, and yeah. now you're selling 36 others. No, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So is that male? Um, something so special that like you have not been able to attain with breeding other animals to make or so what, what I, was kind of the reasoning behind it i am viewing him as an outcross option for my personal yellow caviar lines my nettle lines and um a small side project of dark based animals that i have he okay. he is from inazuma lines but he he is unmatched, in my opinion, to 99% of everything else that's out there. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. I think I've seen a picture of him, and I thought he was, he's yeah. cool. He's He's got, I've, in my mind, I've kind of categorized animals into, like, soft white and, like, yes. hard hard white. And he's, like, he seems kind of soft. 
which I like. For like, sure. I feel like on yellows that that plays really well when it kind of blends in. And um, on dark animals, it seems like that real hard white, that stark white right. is more visually appealing. So You're using the I same think... technology he uses. It's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I think I I think I subconsciously stole it from Emily and Christy, so we might be talking to the same people. <laughs> the um, okay, so you guys are doing all this. What's what's your current strategy for kind of where you're headed? Do you feel like you're like dialed in on animals that you have now? Is there anything you're looking forward? Um, to getting or projects that maybe you want to start, you don't have animals for. I'm just curious on kind of where where it's at, where's the heading. We're not looking at adding much. The only project that we have that really hasn't hit a goal yet is maybe our tricolors and maybe our pattern down. Our our tricolors are doing really good. The tricolor lineup for the following years, it's perfect in my opinion i i wouldn't change anything about it but our we've got a pattern dell project that we're we we have a little bit ourselves but we're collaborating with a few other breeders who are also interested in pattern dells um and so that's probably the newest project we have and the one that we we don't have any results yet yeah that's the least progress (laughs) because we most of the animals are only up to size for next year at this point okay yeah i've got a couple i'm raising out too i'm interested in that that yeah You'll need to show me. I will. Would I like it? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty sweet. It's more it's more drippy than it is Dal. I mean, it's probably it's kind of equal to a lot of the other ones out there, but I think that uh, people will maybe be a little less of there'll be less of haters once they see the nice ones. <laughs> that, that's once you thought. get to the point that there's enough Dal spots for it to not just be a patterned animal with a few blemishes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be amazing. It's, it's got to be equally dull as it is patterned. Yep. I mean, I'm I'm imagining a damn Daniel with completely white pattern underneath it. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it it could be ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, that uh, that will happen. Yeah, one day that will happen eventually. Yeah, people have been spot haters for so long, and honestly, um, it's funny you mentioned damn Daniel because Blizzard, who Br- Brianna Canino owned who also had damn Daniel. That's the, I mean, he wasn't really a super patterned animal, but I loved that animal. He was a yellow, but we're going to ignore that. I just thought he was awesome. And that's kind (laughs) of what inspired my love of pattern dolls and all this spot hate that's happened over the years. I'm like, nah, nah, this is actually pretty cool. If you get a good one. Where did that one go? Where did the, what did you say its name was? The yellow one? Wizard. Yeah. Where did that one go? Aaron Freshwater, right? Yeah. At a Sun Sunkissed. Sunkissed ex- reptiles or exotics. I'm I'm sorry, Aaron, if you're watching this. <laughs> Did uh, they continue I, to breed uh Blizzard or no? I believe so, but yeah, I Yeah, they she did. Yeah, I bet he's retired by now because it's been a few years just since he was sold and he was a very full grown adult at the time he was sold. So she okay. might have retired him by now, but um I do believe she bred him. I have seen so many people start a pattern style project. And then cancel it after one season because mm. because they can't sell the babies. There, there's no one who will buy the very mediocre white first generation offspring. I mean, probably probably the approach needs to be like just sell them as like starter animals, other yeah. than your holdbacks, exactly. and then get to the yeah. point where they're actually nice enough to people right. love them. You know, you probably well, have to kind of bite the bullet for a couple years. Yeah. Mm. We're starting with a few animals that are pretty fairly nice to begin with. They're not like they're spotty. They're not super like ink spotty or anything for the most so part. So what, but... what we're doing, we're starting out pattern first. So we're, we're not trying to like pair a really nice super doll to a random uh, like patterned animal that that's just working backwards. So we're taking really nicely patterned animals and we're pairing them together when, when they have some spottage. Yeah. Um, pe- people will forgive the few spots on the less impressive animals if the pattern's already nice. Uh, we're, we're starting out with a Lone Star Kid from NC Scales. We're, we've got a Avalon Kid from Serena that we're nice. using. Um, 
there, there's a few others. There's but. Oxford. The uh, Oxford kids kind of really kicked it into gear because, um, and that's we we co-own Oxford with um, is it Amy's Critters or something? Amy's Critter Closet. Amy's Critter Closet. So we co-own okay. with him. Her. Her. We co- we co-own Amy. him with her with <laughs> Amy, and he just has produced really really nicely patterned animals with some decent sized sparse but decent sized spots so we're like yeah well, that's other animals that have decent spots so we've already got high pattern and mm. some spots so it's it's a nice place to start because these animals are undeniably gorgeous what's your thought on breeding so getting those super doll spots onto a patterned animal is your what you, i know i had talked with kevin a little bit about this but are you opposed to taking like a traditional, like super light based super doll and breeding it to a patterned animal and getting 50 50 patterned and unpatterned animals to then create like base animals to move from? Or are you going to take pattern to pa- pattern to pattern the whole time? We're trying to take pattern to pattern for as long as we can go. And then once we sort of hit a dead end of there not being anything else to breed into it. We will start uh-huh. using some of the patternless dowels with better spots to yeah. bring more spots into the project. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been wrestling through is like, all right, do I breed in super dowels or do I try to go pattern dowel to pattern dowel? And I've been I, I've got a little time before my animals hit size, but that's something I've been asking myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> You know, you, you guys are talking about pairing. I'm just listening uh, what goes well with what. And so a lot of this stuff is new to me. So um, to to ask you guys what, and, and Noah, I know you said a lot of people ask you about what pairs well with what. Um, Non-stop. Always. <laughs> <laughs> so all your DMs are just, uh, what about the business? What about the pairing? Um, <laughs> so what pairs well, <laughs> what pairs well with what? Uh, what are some, what is some advice for just new, some new breeders coming in? Um, whether they like uh, extreme Harleys or tries or um, phantoms, what what would you suggest? And what are kind of what are kind of the questions that you're asked? And how do you reply? Do's and don'ts. We'll ask Do's that. Yeah. Don't yeah, breed mix and ass animals. <laughs> just <laughs> just <don't>. yeah. <laughs> All right, <Hey>. Mister Petco. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? Oh, I still have animals that trace back to my initial Petco days yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. So funny. um there, there's a time and place for realizing the potential in less assuming animals i i did a test breeding in 2020 i believe where i took two really nice but b grade even c grade animals and i paired them and we got very much a plus results from the resulting offspring because there was so much stacked lineage behind them they wound up far out producing themselves wow i think a lot of it and what noah has talked about a lot you know you talked about hard pattern and soft pattern and that's my favorite um, (laughs) talk like looking at that analyzing that um understanding that these animals are very much selective bred and you're breeding for these traits that are kind of stacked on top of each other. And you like, you can pair some stuff and like work with these genetics from the lineage and you sh- and sometimes you get some really nice results, but you have to also look at the animal that's in front of you and try to find something that's going to work well with that animal. You're not going to want to pair a really nice pinstripe or even an average, like a, like a B grade pinstripe that's a solid animal, but not, you know, like a thousand, thousands of dollars of animal to like a Pangea XXX line or some sort of extreme. Like they're Harley. both amazing animals, but the pattern. Yeah. It's just, just not, it's up. not going to work. Harley, yeah. like true yeah. Harley, like what I would, I would say Pangea, like the really good Pangea XXX. There, there's what, no pinning. There's like no pinning on them. So it's like a true clean of pinning Harley. Put yeah. that with a pinstripe or a Dalmatian. It's just, it's not going to create the nice animals it's not it's going to fall somewhere in the middle and it's just gonna Mm. it's not going to necessarily turn out what you think it's going to turn out you can crash an entire project with one miss um Mm. with with one good idea on paper but if you like look at what's behind the two animals you'll (laughs) you'll completely crash the pairing 
Hmm. What are, what do you think are like, you know, what are what do you think are like some common mistakes people are making right now? From what you see, like not like brand new, like oh, I just bought these two pet co geckos and I brought yeah, them together, but like, like really nice quality animals. Established people, what do you see? Some stuff out there where you're like, why are you doing that? Like, Red is X there anything that you <laughs> say to yourself? Exactly what I was thinking. Red, Red X yellow. I, I don't understand why people are still doing it. Every once in a while, you might turn out a good animal, but for the most part, it's going to be a muddy, muddy babies. Mm. They're just not going to be the nicer quality. The, um, the gamble isn't worth it. It's, it's they, I mean, you're working with something that's got a lot of yellow pigment with something that's got a lot of red pigment. They're just going to kind of combine and not. You have... might get like orange. You might get Maybe. like dirty yellow. If you're, if lucky, you're really lucky, you'll get orange, <laughs> but more than likely you're going to get like muddy reds and some, yeah. some, maybe some nicest yellows, but like kind of muddy brownish yellows. Okay. But we see people, yeah. we see parrot people who are established breeders still doing that. And mm. we're just like, these are so beautiful. <laughs> Why are you doing What are you this? doing? <laughs> what, are, what are you doing? You're shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah. yeah. So I, that's the reds, yellow to yellows. AJ, I, I know you've done like some yellow pinstripe pairings with bloodbath. What what sort of results did you get? Um, have I done a yellow? Or or maybe it was a bloodbath daughter to yellows. I I know there was like some sort of crossover. I'm like... trying to think, man. There's so I, my memory is not as good as yours. Um, this is it's the only thing I can remember. I, when I first started, I didn't have anything to breed bloodbath to. Um, so I got some reds from LAC. And then I think when I first bred him, I bred him to a couple <laughs> yellows and made some, I made some red animals there. Um, yeah. But I don't do it anymore. I think I maybe did it out of necessity back in the day because I didn't really have like red animals to buy. Yeah, red I, animals were not super common, and I I didn't want to buy like red phantoms. Um, back then, for whatever reason, that just didn't interest me. It's working. Backwards. Honestly, the whole like red yeah. pinstripe thing. Huh. Sorry, I lost you there for a second. Hmm. You're you're like breaking up, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It just seems to be going fine now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um. Yeah, I uh, I think I really only did it out of necessity. Um, and I, I kind of stumbled into working with reds, not on purpose. <laughs> so bloodbath, that's a story for another time that I could tell you. But um, <laughs> that was not like that was not like a vision of something I wanted to work with, especially because I'm so colorblind that it made my life very I difficult. So I didn't yeah. know you were colorblind. Very colorblind. So. Okay. <laughs> It was a thing where I, uh, yeah, I kind of stumbled into it and I was like, well, this animal is so awesome that I had to like work with him. Um, but even to this day, I struggle with reds. Like I consider, I consider axing the project like almost every year because they're just so hard for me. Just with the we, colorblindness, it's hard. We finally trimmed down to about three or four red breeders for 2023 yeah something like that okay. super nice animals hopefully they they turn out what they look like you know, they reproduce well so but yeah we we've made stuff that's really nice and then we i i did a lot of red to yellow like pre-2013 um I'm, I'm sure you remember aj like the the reds back then were not that nice um <laughs> some of them were i mean but the head structure was horrible the head structure was horrible there was captain there were maybe two or three other really nice but was captain really red oh he, yes he was, eh, maybe I, old uh, red um but the the quality that i had access to as a literal child was not that nice so I, yeah. I kept crossing yellow, red, yellow, red. I finally crossed Caviar, the first season that I had him, to a yellow female named Kumquat that I still own. And I got oh. one really nice, drippy, but still sort of muddy-based yellow. 
that's the last red yellow pairing I did. I, I have a question for you. First time this ever happened to me this year, two separate yellow pairings popped red animals. <laughs> really? <laughs> and they're, and they're nice. And I'm confused. Is there any red lineage on it? No. Are you sure you're not just I, called blind? <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, there you go. I mean, literally, they're animals that are like legacy lineages for me. So okay. it's like, oh, like High Roller Fanta, or the other one was like, um, oh gosh, Rapala Prism, which is like, it's all yellow. It's yellow like four generations back. And I. I mean, I know where my animals came from, and then the other animals came from, like, Gilpins or Salzmans. Right. It's a pretty closed loop. So I'm confused. I've bred those pairs for years. And this year, I've produced two female animals that are red out of yellow pairs. It's, so It's never it's, happened before. Explain that to me. I don't, I'm still scratching my head. <laughs> I will say I've been seeing more... Um, not Not, like, more as a whole, but across the board, I am seeing more uh, fluke type animals pop up the, the mm -hmm. deeper that we get into selectively breeding what we have. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know of someone who took like a Pangea and a creepy exotic swine. Uh, they, they were both tricolors and they got a random yellow. I, I, I sort of called <laughs> bullshit on it. But they had no yellow collection, no, no yellows in their collection, so it obviously had to have been that. What do you think about all these people popping leucistic animals out of one lily and one normal? I still sort of call bullshit. I that, that's <laughs> our our general suspicion is the concept of Occam's razor is that the most simple explanation is probably it. We've seen enough lilies that are low expression that look like normals that mm. that have been sold as normals and mm. people are buying they're, them. They're popping out 50% lilies, 50% lilies, not then, lilies. And then they get, you know, they get these, these leucistic, these lethal lights that are probably just, it's probably just an unlabeled lily. They should test, they should test breed, split the pairing up and test them to definite not lilies. I, yeah feel like record keeping as a whole across the hobby has room to improve and i i know myself e even last year i mislabeled eggs mm -hmm. and i'm i'm sure that happens some <laughs> um plus let let's be fair if you pair lily white to lily white you're gonna wind up getting more lily whites than you would just pairing a lily white to a well, non lily statistically, you should it would get be about, 50, 25, 25. Yeah, right. statistically, you should get about the same amount if yeah, you, you should get the same amount. Up. Well, so, I mean, this is speaking of oops. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, you will because, but like when you actually work out all the statistics, right. it's going to be the same. So it's not worth it. It'll be the same, them. except for 25% of them are going to die. Yeah. Mm. I do know of several people that are still trying to hit the white well that is the viable leucistic. Yeah. So that I'm I'm sure that's playing some sort of role into the yeah random. Yeah. You would loose. think so many people have tried. You would think that if it was going to happen, it would have happened. I yeah. I heard secondhand as late as like three weeks ago of someone else starting a project to try. And I'm like, come on. And what do you, when you when you say starting a project to try, are they like saying like I'm gonna go buy some F1 I'm animals and try to make these odds myself? I am God. I am going to crack the code, and there, there's no code to be cracked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I there could be some miracle thing that aligns that maybe one lives, but. Is it going to make it to adulthood? Probably not. Is it going to yeah. breed? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Even I, if I you got someone, past it hatching. Yeah. So someone's trying to like cross cappuccinos in to like weaken the lily white. I'm, I'm not like saying this as fact, but <laughs> let's this, make this, it even weaker right. and that'll work. Right. 
Uh, someone suggested crossing uh, Cirrus and Norums in. I know that yeah. they're attempting it right now, but that's a whole nother rabbit hole. You I know. thought you guys mainly breed hybrids now. Isn't that your business? Yeah. Yes, only hybrids. Only hybrids. Hybrids only. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just change our name to hybrids only. Only hybrids. Only hybrids, yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah, man. you could. You could. Just lean mm. into it. Yeah. Just lean into it. <laughs> that would be a great sticker for you to make, actually. Or merch. Or mm. Aquana. <laughs> Home of all hybrids. Right. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, we only breed hybrids. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but then you get people hitting you up all the time, like, "Yo, you got any hybrids for sale?" I, I still have the occasional <laughs> message about the photoshopped, crusty, uh, grandest hybrid that I made. Oh my gosh! Does the, where some... does that photo live? Is that like on Instagram somewhere? Or yeah, how do we see this? It's, it's still on Instagram. <laughs> from like 2019 or so i think so That's he's fun. done a blue one and then he did a um did you do anything for this year for april fools i don't think you did no i did a crusty leo yeah okay that was the crusty leo people legitimately thought that we were trying that we were hybridizing crusties and leos it was it was a little interesting but <laughs> yeah so you, you just have to roll with it sometimes yeah, yeah you just gotta lean into it that's true mm -hmm. um so Harry, we started talking about like selective breeding. Yeah. Um, breeding. Yeah. I, I'll kind of let you lead this, Harry, because you're you're kind of in the you're this. in the phase yeah. of learning all this. So I, you yeah. know, I'd love you to kind of you know ask these questions. It's uh, it's yeah. definitely something that I think about a lot. Um, yeah. but it's good for you to. We've talked about it, but get a different perspective from Noah. It. I dream about yeah. it. So how would we how do we define it first of all? What's selective breeding? What's line breeding? What's inbreeding? Oh, what is is there other differences? Okay. Fire away. That's that's going to be me. So selective breeding yeah. is going to be breeding for traits. You're going to be picking a trait and you're going to be trying to match those traits up so that they keep stacking and keep stringing and so like and refining a trait. Um yeah. uh line breeding is going to be selective and strategic inbreeding. And usually it is not a direct inbreeding. It, it is usually going to be like an animal that has X relative way back and another animal that has X relative so many generations back. You see it a lot in dogs and horses and other things. They just try to bring that yeah. up. Um, if there's a popular stud that has really good qualities that they really want in their animals, they might find they, they might like they might line breed that way. And inbreeding is mm. going to pretty much be direct inbreeding. There's going to be the direct inbreeding and the what I would personally call indirect breeding, which would be the line breeding. So the direct inbreeding would be the parent child, sibling, sibling, etc. Gotcha. And then how would you know if we talk about the ethics of whatnot? And I know I know that happens all the time, right? Um, but what is too close? What is too far? Uh, I mean, I guess there's no too far, but what is too close? <laughs> and and in what scenario is what justified? I guess we'll say that. Right, right. Because I know what happens. And, <clears throat> and um, yeah. yeah. For the longest, I had a very kosher uh, idea of what was ethical or not. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I talked to AJ at the October Tenley because I know that he's done some very well thought out line breeding and I wanted to experiment with it for mm -hmm. like Matt, now that we're in 2022, like almost everything's related. Yeah, so I wanted certainly. to <laughs> see what AJ's results were and see if he ran into any issues with it. Um, as for me right now, I don't like doing parent to offspring or sibling to sibling. I did a grandsire to granddaughter pairing this season i'm doing like one or two others next season of the same sort of uh distant line breeding um that's what i feel safe with i know aj's done parent i've done to parent child. to, parent to child. child i've never yeah. done uh sibling to sibling ever yeah never. the the concern being with cresties is that we have such a limited original starting pool with these animals yeah. and yeah. um reptiles are resistant to inbreeding effects but they're only so resistant 
to these inbreeding effects. There's a line in leopard geckos called Black Knight. You've probably heard of it. They're pitch yeah. black animals. Yeah. Some of them yeah. don't turn out, but the best ones, the ones you typically see are pitch, pitch, pitch black. But the pure, yeah. they've basically been a closed breeding group in Europe with the original, with the creator for over a decade when they were released finally. Mm. And that was, I think five years ago. So yeah. this is generations of generations of generations of these animals being bred back to each other, all this stuff. I see. And we have short noses, we have small body size, short tails, oversized eyes, and poor fertility amongst uh, other okay. things. Um, I've yeah. got a female who's actually like, I think she's a first gen outcross. She was petted to me for safekeeping, but I think she's a first gen outcross and she actually can't lay fur legs because she prolapses oh. every time she lays a fur leg because her body structure is just too small to handle a larger fur leg. She can lay infertiles just fine, but that's this a, is your black knight. Yes, and this is this okay. is this the the breeder who produced her gave her to me because they knew that I would not do anything with her. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's not neurological issues that we've seen necessarily with the black knights, but the there's structure, physical, structural, and actual health issues with them. Mm, okay. And so interesting. Yeah. It's an outcrossing to anything unrelated has been super, super successful, but that's even a gene pool that's much, much, much larger than Cresties. So we have to be conscientious of this, or we're going to start we're, having lower fertility, more failed eggs, which um, I'm noticing more and more. We're going to have a lot of um, problems and having like, a pair that is related only by, you know, the singular grandsire here mm. is, is that's the one thing, as long as you outcross any offspring beneath that to stuff that is unrelated or less related than the parent child pairing. Um, yeah. And you, like stuff can be fairly inbred and be fairly okay. It's just, you have to be conscientious of when is it too far? You can't, especially with a small pool like Cresties, you can't just keep, yeah, pairing and pairing and pairing and, pairing and turn and pairing. the family tree into a family breed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think that that's, I think that that's good rationale. I think um, something that I think about a lot, and your example with leopard geckos, one thing that's interesting about leopard geckos is their time to breed is much faster. Mm. So, ten years in leopard geckos is like thirty years in crested geckos. You can have 10 generations in 10 years. Yeah. If you almost hit size quick enough, you can have 10 generations in 10 years. That's a lot. And a lot of those wholesalers like Mac and those guys, like I'd been to Reptiles by Mac, their leopard geckos reach adulthood in six and a half, seven months. You can oh. you can absolutely have animals reach adulthood in six and a half to seven months. Yeah. And so, I mean, that up. that's yeah. just perpetuating... Right. It, like it black, be black, black Knight could literally be... I mean, it could be 15 generations. Yeah. It could literally be 15 generations of sibling to sibling yeah. so, in 10 years, Yeah, which is crazy. What do you guys think? I, I'm just going to play devil's advocate here because I just want to have the conversation. But as far as like crested geckos, um, like when they crested geckos or rachidaculus in general, like when they go and they find Lichianus in New Cal, like often they have communal laying sites. So where animals are not moving from the point of birth far enough where they're not coming back to like they're laying often in the place they were born that's what they were finding right and in that kind of like a closed um environment do you think um i mean clearly there would be inbreeding happening there i'm not saying it justifies us intentionally doing it right um but what do you think about like the endemic nature of geckos not moving far from where they are born it's still going to be a it, this is this is an aspect of um what's the terminology for it just just natural biology and natural behaviors you uh -huh. can't really compare captive selective breeding or captive inbreeding to wild inbreeding because they're still going to be randomly selecting you're going to have loss of eggs and yeah you know, babies are going to get a baby crest is going to get snapped up by a lychee or whatever. Uh, there, it's still a very random selection. And when mm -hmm. you look at the lineages on crested geckos, you don't see a lot of like super mm -hmm. dowels in with a lot of pinstripes, partly because that's, you know, counterintuitive that like we yeah. talked about earlier, but because we're artificially selecting that it's, it's a greater concern, especially because we're starting with such a small and those animals can still move in and out of the area. They might still, 
naturally mix, but it's you can't really compare a wild population to a captive population simply because we are we are artificially selecting things. Um, yeah. Then the I, the plants the plants that created the wild mustard that created um, Brussels sprouts and broccoli and a bunch of other stuff it didn't naturally turn into that we had to yeah select we had to selectively it. yeah mm-hmm. what I think what about I, sorry go ahead no you're what what I've tried to explain to people is we started out with the two to four hundred animals to to begin with back in the nineties. Hmm. But I really count like 2005 to 2010 as being the infancy of the high-end gecko market. Hmm. So it, if you look at a nice pinstripe out there that's not from your lines because you've got the like straight to Rapashi and Derek Dunlop hmm. or whatever, um, it, it all goes right back to Leather Wrap. Leather Wrap, yeah. Like um, any pinstripe it's all going back to love right so my question i was going to ask so even if we had from my from my knowledge because i was not that i'm like the earliest one we were kind of around the same time but like really the people that were bought like the animals that were producing nice animals were so few that i would i would dare to say that every animal that is nice that exists today probably traces back to like 15 or 15 or less animals total okay like across dalmatians across like i think dalmatians like i i've gone down the rabbit trail of buying dalmatians in the past couple years they're all related literally that's probably the shallow shallowest gene pool of anything and and you see it like the heads look awful the body composition on some of the uh Ske- more sketchy origined dells it is yeah. not the same as like a good healthy cresty yeah. um i i've noticed that S- something that i've tried to explain to other people like there's a little rap okay that's a singular animal little rap is bound to have had siblings so yeah because what produced him it was like somewhere. Uh, Pin Allen and Stripe Out or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which are just I, two two Rapashi animals. Right. So but if you go back even a step further, right. are, are probably they, are those, they, are, those might be... Are si- I'm not saying... I mean, the Gilpins wouldn't have known. But right. the reality is even in Allen's collection, there was probably only one or two pinstriped animals that mm. were collected. And that's the origin of all pinstripes based on the origin of pinstripes that i've heard secondhand from other people that that have been in the hobby longer um the pinstriping trait was produced by taking the flame type animals that had the highlighted pinning and breeding for increased expressions of the highlighted pin scales yeah that's why back in the day people were selling 70%, 80%, 90%. So you get to the point where Mm -hmm. the quickest, and in my opinion at the time, it was not unethical way, was to pair daughter to sire or mother to son to to help speed up the process of getting a full pinstriped animal. Mm. So... From there, you've got to like try to keep everything separate. That way you're not inevitably building an even more convoluted family wreath. I I love calling it a the wreath. family wreath because it works. <laughs> it's a circle. Um, yeah. <laughs> so in 2020, I think, I I undertook like getting the extended lineage on everything that I had. I had it to my memory. I had a few generations like in my memory. I didn't have everything. So I sat down and I tracked everything that I had as far back as I could. 70% of my collection trace it in 2020. I, I need to recount it now. It all traces back to five breeders. And out of those five breeders, it was like one or two animals in their collection. Mm-hmm. So like Ridge and Valley, they produced um, 
they, they had Castellano and Crescenza, Pins and Uno back in the day. Yeah. And that line of pinstripes is everywhere, not just in pinstripes, but it's in Harleys, it's in yellows. There's a Dow line that has pins and Uno lineage in it. Hmm. And everything is built on that. At this point, it's five or six generations back. And I, I try not to pair them back into themselves, but if it's that far back, I don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. But even then, you're building upon this foundation of super convoluted yeah. lineage. Yeah. At what point? So, like you said, you you know you don't worry about it five six generations back. Like what? At what point is the point where you say it's out of my hands to control? Like, and also, I just right. think about so many so many animals that people are that people are buying are like are unlineaged animals and they inject them into the collection. Right. But like, so example, and I like, I love Pangea. I think they're a great company. Um, But I go to Tinley, I see 50 adult animals get bought at Tinley with, with very sketchy lineage on them. Right. Historically, I think they're trying to do a better job of track now. Um, but yeah. then people inject those into their collections with zero idea. So it's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of hypocritical. To, like so, when I see that, when people are like crazy about lineage and buy unlineaged animals and build them into their collection with no background, I'm like, yeah, you know, to make your mind up, pick okay. or shoot, you know, which one are you going to do? <laughs> so I personally have one Pangea animal in my collection. I have two or three that have Pangea in their lineage. Yeah. I treat them as a wild card. I try not to cross them unless like I absolutely have to, like with a um, date Mike and pasteurized cheese product. Date Mike goes back to the Betty White line, pasteurized cheese product is from their XXX line crossed with their uh, Bumblebee. It's their Bumblebee project. the, The Bumblebee line. Um, I, I try to treat them as a wild card. They might be related to anything else from Pangea, so I try not to double it. Okay. Yeah, that's a good way. You know, I think that you're doing it the right way of just kind of treating it. You know, you're not just mixing that into everything you got going on just to, yeah. you know, no, because, it, because it looks nice. Or <laughs> we, I, I still look at animals with no lineage. Uh-huh. I, I look at them as a wild card. I will not use them as a star mel. I will it'll not. Be like a, it'll be like a one to one or something. Like, oh, mm-hmm. if, if it's a female and it's from unknown lineage, and I know that the unknown lineage doesn't like go back to like a certain source, like LEC or Get Gone a Days or anything like that, where BFG, BFG, right? Um, I'll. I'll try to incorporate it one or two seasons and see what happens. And mm-hmm. An example of that, we had a yellow female that I actually picked up from a local pet Termaline. store. Her name is Tourmaline. She ended up being a really nice, drippy, soft pattern. She was yellow, probably from peachy. AC lines or something. AC or, or one of the other, you know, it was a local Big pet producer, store, so I don't know who provided their stock. It could have been just a local person too. It could have been a local person. It could have been somebody random. So because we can tell, we we're pretty sure it probably just didn't at least go back to at least one of the big breeders. Maybe went back to one of the commonly used pet store stockers or at least someone local. You know, we used her for a couple of seasons. I, I did we end up keeping any babies from her? Yeah. We've got one. She's with us celestial right now. Okay, yeah. But she, but we've got, you know, we got some nice babies from her and um, so we did sell her. Um, but, she, you know, we, we got a couple, but we kind of treated her as an unknown lineage, like a pet store, like a pet co type lineage. The, the way I look at the offspring coming from wholesale, like pet co and pet store suppliers is most likely a closed um, collection. So mm-hmm. I I highly doubt that they're buying animals from you Lala Rap animals, or yeah, or other big names and using them in their stock. 
Yeah, so I fair. look at that's it fair. as like I, I won't build a project around it unless it's something just absolutely ridiculous. Those are probably also some of that's probably some of the more inbred stuff though. Oh, they absolutely. Also, if you think about like if you were a big wholesaler and like you're putting together groups, Pretty it's much. like you hold back animals, you're just gonna go, which ones look the same and right. are nice? And then they just keep breeding building new groups every th two, three years over the past twenty years. I think you know, they're not they're not lineage tracking at these places they're so. producing fifty thousand animals. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, like AC, from what I understand, they have a closed collection have for when I last looked at it years ago, it was like for 10 years, they just, they, they haven't added anything in the collection sure, for, sure. for a long, yeah. for at least at that point he touted on his website that, so you have to think, I mean, I don't know how many he started with, but at the point he was at, he's probably got a lot of related animals. And most of that's from Rapashi. And, yeah. To begin yes. with. So, you know, yeah. there's going to be, there's going to be relatives there. And I would never personally pair an AC, like if an AC line animal to an AC line animal, just for that. What do you guys think about like the new genetic morphs, like Xanthic, Cap, you know, all that stuff. Originally, you know, every lineage, every Lily animal has shared lineage. Absolutely. So has a, has a core <laughs> ancestor. Um, what's your approach to that? Would you ever work with those animals? What would your approach be to that? I am cautiously optimistic with them. Okay. I feel like if we as a hobby incorporate them into our collections and are careful with how we breed them and market them and sell them and who we sell them to and how we sell them, it has the potential to remain viable far into the future. But if we keep pairing like sibling to sibling or just very convoluted pairings, um, it, it'll it reach a genetic bottleneck so so quickly. I will say at least with stuff that is, is a, that's a dominant type gene, like cappuccino and like lily white, you can mm -hmm. outcross it and still get the thing you're looking for. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because it's a dominant, it's going to inherit 50% of the time, no matter what. I mean, obviously the genetic odds that actually comes out, it's going to vary, it can be skewed. but statistically, if you breed enough of the singular animal, you're going to get about 50, 50 statistically. Um, mm. But you're still going to get these animals. Same with cappuccino. If you breed these cappuccinos to a normal quote unquote, normal animal, you're still going to get animals that are cappuccino. The, the concern I do have with a Xanthix being recessive um, it's just re breeding that responsibly. What with the, um, genetic what we know about inbreeding what we know about their resistance but also what we know about their risk um when it comes to breeding these and i don't think it can't be done responsibly it's just a concern that pe people need to consider and you get people that are pairing their one xanthic to like 15 different females a season yeah and thus flooding with a singular male yeah. yeah you know genetics yeah i think so I got an Xanthic male that I'm growing out. And I think my approach is going to be that I'm going to try to make myself a lot of different variety of hats, you know, from a bunch of different stuff. Mm -hmm. So nice. that at least, you know, like not like a ton of different animals, but a select group of like, I'm going to breed it to this. I'm going to breed it to that. Like, and yeah. try to get some, try to kind of get some diversity in the project. Like pick, pick a few different things. Yeah and yeah. see what you can get from that. I think that's great. Yeah, and um, trying to de it, try to at least deepen it a little bit, you know, add some depth to what's going on and maybe add head structure, add body yeah. size, add like the stuff that I feel like the animals are lacking, like prioritize that more than yeah. anything else, like strong animals that lay good eggs, that have big heads, that mm -hmm. are like, you know, good body composition. Like mm -hmm. that's probably going to be my focus more than anything else on yeah. like mm -hmm. on Gen 1. I am yeah, I... somewhat more optimistic in general about cappuccinos because from what everything that's coming out, they've been around a lot longer than we thought they have been. They've been uh -huh. existing for a lot longer. So they're a lot more outcrossed in general. And um, I mean, we don't have lineage on a lot of them because they're coming out of, you know, reptiles by Max sort of places and, and mm -hmm. other, um, whole, other wholesale breeders. And um, 
but they're they're still going to be after you know we've they've been paired a few generations, there's still going to be stuff. They may have come from a singular animal, but it, since they've been around for so long and we didn't really know they existed, they've been just kind of bred around, da, da, da. So it's, I have a little more optimism when it comes to pairing like a cap to a cap. You say that though, because, ne- because there's a viable super form. Well, that's part of it. There can be viable but weak supers that happened with the Max Super Snow for a while, but as it outcrossed, it got very, very strong. No, I, I mean, like, people will intentionally be pairing sibling to yeah, sibling to fit supers to get more money to get more caps. Yeah. That's where that's ethics cool. comes into play, but at least if you're taking, like, pairing of Lily White to a Lily White, we know they're pretty closely related because we know how far back they go. We know about when they originated. We don't know exactly when the caps originated, so we know they're probably a little less inbred because they've just kind of been sprinkled across some stuff. It's and- going to get only increasing, increasingly yeah. worse, that is gonna though. That's the problem. It's going to be increasingly worse and as people it's breed. It's not going to get better because no. everybody right now is intentionally so intentionally line breeding them to prove animals like which is fair which is fair because I, I people are buying them. getting one from a show and then producing you know opposite sex offspring and breeding them back to prove yeah and then those animals are going to be sold and those animals are going to be you know yeah. sibling to sibling or whatever you know it's like i yeah. you know. i won't we won't personally bash anyone that's doing it to prove their line. Uh-huh. Us personally, like what we're choosing to do, we're not trying to make supers. I, I have zero desire to produce them. We have access to three cappuccinos. One of them, a friend owns, we own two. Um, we're trying to work them into our red and yellow and high white projects ju- just to expand on the actual trait right. itself and see what we can do with it and how it affects other traits. And um, there's a whole new frontier with it. It's, it is a whole new frontier, but we just, we're not interested in making supers or the super lilies, like the, or the super cap lilies. I want a except... frap, but. <laughs> I mean, a frap, a frap is a cappuccino lily, so it's like the single right. gene, but like we're just not interested in the supers. But people who are making supers need to be aware that they need to do it responsibly. If they're yeah. proving stuff out, that's fine. Um, but just be mindful of like what you're producing and how you're producing it overall. And I get it. Like the, the monetary gains of producing a lot of supers is very, very enticing. Mm-hmm. But you, you've got to make a line in the sand where money stops talking and ethics do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there like a source, uh, you know, as a new breeder, like just hearing all this is, is really interesting uh, for me. Is there like a source um to that you guys can go to for understanding what's what when it comes to lineage and the history of these geckos or is it just really just talking and asking we are working on a database slash Mm. list of the common lineage that's out there yeah because you yeah because you guys mentioned lolly wrap and i i have no idea i just know it's a pinstripe (laughs) everything um Um, andrew and sarah own him he he's He's still alive, if I remember correctly. I, I know they posted the picture a, a few months ago. Yeah. Um, okay. But just we're going to, like, at some point, we're going to make a, a an informational thing, just breaking down super common hmm. animals and where you typically okay. find them. Just here's Lola Rap. This is what he looked like. Here's where you typically find his so, lineage in these sorts of projects. Like, like a perfect yeah, example, there are multiple lelrap based projects that are going in completely different directions. I know that mm. there's a dark based one <clears throat> with a druid at Zingex. Yeah. A mm. druid is a lelrap green kid, I believe. And he's making the nicest white walled quad striped, just stunning thick white pattern animals. Uh, I know Emily and Christy at uh, Emily Emily Burke, Burke reptiles rep, reptiles and Christy's reptile room. They they're taking the little rap line in a similar in a very similar direction, but it's a different offshoot of of that project. Mm-hmm. So like mm-hmm. there's gotcha. there seem to trend more towards drippy pattern and more orange. It 
I, I hope I'm not talking out my ass here, but <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking about the, uh, the, the stuff. Um, what do we have? The post? way, the way that I kept it was I kept it yellow quads. Right. Mm -hmm. You're, you're mm -hmm. keeping it yellow quads. Like and... I have a, I have a direct, I probably, if you want to buy like Lella wrap as close as possible, I probably have the closest ones outside the guild pens. <laughs> because I got so my yeah. animal Rapala is a Lella Rap animal, obviously. Yummy. Because of the yep. name. Um and I, that I, animal Andrew always said, if Lella Rap dies, I'm gonna need Rapala back because Aww. he's the close he's the closest one to him I've ever made. And this was, you know, five, six, seven years ago. But um yeah, so it's funny. I feel like that's actually the original look. I mean, he was a yellow pinstripe, a yellow quad. No. And it's gotcha. funny that like Druid and like Emily's stuff originates from that. It's crazy. We had something else that was unexpectedly related to Lola Rap, and I don't remember what it was, but I think it was a dark, like white wall thing or something. Yeah, it traced back to Lil Rap through Gekani days. Uh like a great great grandsire was uh, Atlas, who was Lilla Rap and then somebody. <laughs> Chexy. Atlas Chexy. Oh, no. Yeah, that was it. Mm. One of the pairs oh. I know, very few of them. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, also, we, for our personal animals, when we we're still building our website, we've been building it for like three years no big deal uh, <laughs> but we're actually putting some work into the website and on our personal animals we're going to have extended lineage as far back as we can go That's um cool. just so yeah. people and so people can learn about our animals and what they're buying from us and then see oh you know i've discovered that this gecko is actually traces back further than i thought and we've got people yeah. that we've communicated with um William Clark is an awesome. Thank you, William, so much. He's an awesome, awesome resource. He and Noah, their minds are just like like traps. They trap all the information. <laughs> and if Noah doesn't know what William knows when it comes to lineage, mm. so we've just so far, I don't know anything William doesn't know. So, but you've also talked to William about stuff. So yeah, but, but... if I'm not sure, I'm I'm positive William knows. Oh yeah. So we're so we can at least have our animals all as far back as we can trace. We will okay. we'll have that, and then um, hopefully people will be able to look at our animals and find familiar names from their own lineages. And we've got trace so it. much in our collection that traces back to so many different breeders, both like current and way back in the day. Like the odds are very high that there's some overlap with 99% of the other groups that are out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the goal is not to like keep everything completely separate since everything's related pretty much, but um, yeah. just to be more responsible with yeah. how we can, how close things are. Basically. Yeah. At the okay. end of the day, I want to be intentional when we're pairing related animals. <laughs> and Some if we are, pairing them, I want it to be as far back as possible, unless there's gotcha. a more pressing reason that we're pairing like grandsire to granddaughter mm -hmm. or something like that. Something I was going to ask you, Noah, something that's been popping up a lot for me recently, which has been kind of confusing and, and also just like an interesting thing. I've been getting tagged in a bunch of photos um, of people's <laughs> animals where they claim like they're like, oh, this is this and that. Like they're extended lineage on animals, and I'll get tagged. And I've had a lot of people tagging me in posts and saying pairs of animals that I never paired together. I <laughs> have personally seen that happen with two animals for my stock. Who so, was it? It's been happening to me like weekly. A while. But but like who was the what was the pair that was supposedly? I I know one of them. It was like two females. <laughs> Really, and obviously didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. or I've or I've seen people like list like one of my animals and then the name of another animal that I don't even own, and I'm like, <laughs> but I'm getting tagged in all these posts. So I guess my question is like, I wonder how much like lineage, mm. like screw ups exist. So yeah, yeah. Like, like is I it is it a lot? Because I would think it's probably a yeah. lot. So just like what I was saying earlier. I really feel like there's a lot of room to grow when it comes to record keeping. Mm. 
and oh yeah the hobby yeah and this oh, is yeah. assuming that like even all bre- all, bre- all breeders are going to follow the same type of code you know some people might just insert certain things and yeah uh, i've yeah. personally seen that happen and it's, or people yeah. are hatching animals and they say oh this is so nice hmm. i'm just like i'm not saying i don't know if anyone does this but like i'm sure they do that they oh. just lie they just lie right. about the lineage so that people yeah. feel like they're getting an outcross right yeah. yeah you know like oh yeah i produced this dark quad <laughs> out of this random yellow pair and people are like oh great but in reality it's the pair that like they've sold a million offspring from already or or more often it, it's not done maliciously they simply don't know that they're nice Egg yellow pens, right mm. it's a little rap daughter granddaughter or whatever yeah yeah i just think there's a lot i think the the tracking of this stuff is super muddy I don't think, and I don't know, I think there's a point where we can probably go too far, and I I don't know where that is. I don't think, In in my opinion, I don't think you can go too far in the record keeping itself. Especially moving forward, you know. Yeah, I do feel like you can go too far in terms of, like, feeling like your way is the only way to really parse out that information or use yeah. that information. Um, I meet me personally, I'm trying to work towards being a bit more open-minded to how other people do like the line breeding slash inbreeding and stuff like yeah. that. But at the same time, I also know that there is a hard line in the sand of where you're just being shitty. Yeah. I think so. that's fair. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah. You know, I think that there's something that's that is um, interesting to me is where a lot of our nicest animals have been sold to overseas. Um, They don't care about lineage at all. Well, (laughs) they literally, well, majority don't. I mean, I've I've sold hundreds of animals over there. Nobody asked for pairs. They're just like, I like this one. I'll take it. I I personally know <laughs> of three breeders over there that are doing a better job at tracking. And I am so happy about that. Sanha's one. Is it who else? They're they're two smaller. Two smaller yeah. people. But there's some people over there that are really trying hard to improve that sort of information, improve um, how they're keeping the animals and a whole bunch of other things. So they're they're work, they're just basically in their infancy, like where we were. You know, they're they're just like however many years behind us. Now, what what completely drives me mad is people viewing the Korean stock as an outcross option. It's not. And they're and only same like, with Europe, man. Europe's not an outcross American option either. Uh, yeah. Your Europe was a valid option like ten no, years ago. No, it wasn't. It was all Derek Dunlop. Really? Yes. Where do you think majority of his crusteds went? They all went to Europe. <laughs> They were high-end. He sold sold almost all the yellows to Europe. And then I remember like two, three years later, people are like coming. I was just, I just saw him like a couple weeks ago and we were talking about it. And he's like, oh yeah, you know, the yellow pinstripe, the European line. And that I always, I always (laughs) correct people and like, that's Derek Dunlop line. There literally wasn't yellow pins in Europe before he shipped them there. I didn't realize that. Well now, okay. well, now we know if we ever need to get some Derek Dunlop yellow pins, we know where to go. Buy, buy them from Europe. So mm. I, I was a kid. I I was a kid. I was like 17, 18 mm-hmm. when he left the hobby. Yeah. And I, I didn't have the funds to like buy any direct stock from him. So I waited and waited and... I kid you not, every single time something that popped up from his lines, like directly from him, went up for sale, I didn't have the money for it. I got one. <laughs> Meredith got one before we got married, and I'm using him this season. He's making the best babies I, I could have hoped for from him. He's a very awesome. classic. His name's Bonsai. He's been around a little bit. He was at Zengex. That's who I got him he from. He was at Zengex. He was with someone else. He was with oh. Mendel Geckos, but they never brought him. He's gone through a few hands, but he makes some really fantastic babies. So Derek, and he's like, even now, looking at Bonsai, he's still top of the line. He, he's a nice. very soft. It's funny, it's funny. when we were in... Um... We we're in Daytona and Derek was there and we were we were hanging out in the hotel room and he was looking at I was pricing geckos. He was looking at him and it was kind of a combination of he'd pick one up and be like, 
wow, this is crazy. This is nice. And then the next one would be like, I made these like 15 years ago. Why is this so expensive? You know, he was just like troll. He was just trolling me, which I loved. You know, it's it's fun. I, it's hilarious because it's true. I mean, a lot of this stuff has not progressed. He was way way ahead of his time. Yeah, totally. in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. No. especially on yellows, man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he inspired um, me. <laughs> so I, I'm gonna do a hard hard uh, hard shift here. Okay. Um, All right. We're going to talk about a little bit of the gecko business um, before we oh, yeah. eventually land the plane. There but this that. has been really good. Like, <laughs> been we got to talk helpful. about that sometime. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the you know the gecko business, is <laughs> is this bo- um, a side hobby for you both? Is it full time? Is it so a full time business? Or I like? I'm a full time artist. I view the geckos as a part time job. Meredith awesome. is a full time pharmacy yeah. tech. She views it as a part-time job. We see okay. the potential to make it a full-time hobby, though. It does take some yeah, full-time job, full-time hobby. hobby full-time it, it's job. a full-time hobby. It's right a full-time now. hobby, <laughs> but a uh, full-time job for because I would like to get out of retail. I mm. retail sucks. Anybody who's been in retail can tell you. And all you the have same so choice. much more potential on the reptile side of things. Yeah, there's no progress in the the position and and area that I work. There's no real progression in like what you can do like mm. like like yeah. position wise whatever so there's a lot more that i can progress with with reptiles and i just have always loved animals that's what i wanted it's to more exciting. work with yeah so we're we're that's we're, we're hoping that we can turn it into my full-time job us personally we're doing a pretty major downsizing for the next two years or so then we're rebuilding with some more species in addition to the crested mm. and leopard geckos that we have okay. um as far as the viability of doing it as a small business, it's definitely there. You just have to look at it with the right mindset. Um, if you're entirely profit driven or completely driven by the bottom dollar, you're not going to make it. Yeah. But either A, you're you're not going to be passionate enough about the animals or B, you'll piss off literally the entire hobby. <laughs> Or on the flip side of that, if you love the animals too, too much, you might get in over your head, have too many animals, not be able to mm. sell as much, try to, Absolutely. try to preserve stuff that you, that, you know, or try to do things that maybe aren't super viable. Like you kind of have to meet and it'll have a passion for these animals while also viewing it as with a, a slightly business mindset of, you know, what are some ways I can ship this? What is the best pairings to make the pretty things that will sell or, you know, so like the, what the, you got to do? The way that we approach it, we view the profits we make from the reptiles as a way to be able to afford to work with the reptiles. We have to be paid for the time that we're investing into them. We have to... Right. Um, like make it worthwhile to have 400 animals in our house versus like five pet only Cresties mm-hmm. or Leos or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So we just have to find yeah. the best way to do that. So yeah, we are profit motivated, but at the same time, like the ethics and our love of the animals come I I breed what I breed. Yeah. And we breed what we breed because we love it. We really like but it. The market for yellows honestly isn't great. <laughs> but the potential is True. there. It's my favorite thing to work with. Yeah. It's interesting, man. It's like a wave. The, well, the yellows are like a wave. Yes. yes. It's like one year I can't produce enough. The next year I can't move them. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I think this year is going to be a so good one. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been good. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, for, so for you guys personally, you guys are downsizing a little bit and rebuilding with what you guys basically a bit of a reset. You mentioned earlier, right? We're, we're so, kind of trimming um, some fat. We have a few repeats. We have some, just a few X. Like we want to by, just... by repeats. We're talking about lineage that's repeated a few times, like throughout okay. the collection. Like three different females that are all yellow. Harleys. Three different Anazuma line females. Yeah. we only need one. Yeah. Mm. So we're gonna even pick though the... I I would keep all of them. But... <laughs> well, so or you know, with anything like that, we're just gonna you know look which one is the best one or which one so... makes what we want. 
trim down the others and just sort of tighten the collection a little bit, not to, you know, cross tighten everything together. Tighten is a really good word for tighten it. it. Just tighten it up a little bit. In, in addition to the, like, downsizing and all that, we're also upgrading everything that we have. We're, mm. we're getting larger enclosures for the terrestrial geckos and snakes. I'm mm. revamping my crested gecko Set enclosures. Same, same size, same maker, uh, DW geckos and terraria. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a very yeah. loyal supporter. Um, <laughs> um, I want to be completely top of the line and cutting mm-hmm. edge when, when it comes to the husbandry that we provide. We're, we're looking okay. at, yeah. um, hopefully eventually they'll make it, but, um, we are really, really excited by like the, the Viv-tech, VivTech bulbs yeah. and what they're doing. And if they can make stuff that's like, that's like the tube LEDs, um, mm, go across yeah. multiple cages, um, that's something we're really interested in adding. We're, we're our using crusties. Arcadia right now, but the viability of VivTech is incredible. Yeah. So they're rather than pucks, there are two tube lights that go. Right. Across. Yeah. We we're okay. right now we're using like just full spectrum. Tube. We're, we're using Arcadia. Arcadia. Well, they're just they're just Shade you know dweller. they're tube lights that go across multiple cages, so they can it's get a cheaper. gradient top to bottom. It is cheaper we without get, cutting the quality. We get multiple cages mm-hmm. at the same time. It's it, you're they're gonna. But the life on the VivTech bulbs is way longer. So, and we like we like his passion and his his science and his continued drive to upgrade. He's so smart. If you've never heard, I swear we're not paid by him. We're not paid by him. We don't have any. <laughs> I I want to do it for my leopard We geckos. were completely like, sold on the product at March Tinley, I think we got... we talked for a while and I loved it. So that's what we're hoping to do. But just constantly trying to to promote like teach teach the full spectrum i guess is a good way to do it tell people yeah. how the best way to do it at an effective setup for them without it being a full bioactive with you know six inches of substrate layers and all this stuff that can be cost prohibitive for some people at the beginning mm. Um, but also show people how to do that. Like just have the spectrum available of, of information and setups so that we zoo can show quality. people. Zoo quality. Backroom zoo quality. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that, you know, people can see, you know, you don't, you, you, we're not keeping these animals like bare bones, whatever, like not super bare bones, but you can do a little more there and then yeah. um, show them how to do the big stuff and have that yeah. high end, you know, driving forward stuff. I, I love what UAJ and Gabby at Morph Menagerie have done. Like that setup, it shows that it's possible to have a massive number of breeders and it still be ethical and well taken care of and not yeah. appalling to non reptile keepers and breeders. Yeah, that, it's that's cool to be able to bring people in there. there. <laughs> like um something looks fine to us but we bring in grandma or a random person that doesn't know reptiles and it looks like a whole hoarding situation yeah <laughs> yeah and it's like, really it's been game changing to have a misting system in the in the full fun. pvc yeah. setup so like <laughs> everything everything's getting sprayed also in all those so there's 166 pvc cages that are getting auto sprayed Mm -hmm. three times a day it's crazy so that's been like a game changer and i feel like i can i can just provide no it's all custom i can talk to you about it it's it's, uh, we will definitely talk about it i told you it's 10 times cooler than miss king okay <laughs> so but stuff it. like that i mean people there's a lot of talk with different kinds of groups that are basically like breeders care about the bottom dollar and they're going to keep them in these bear cages and they're doing this mm. and that and obviously you're not where mm. ours are not like that but we're going to upgrade ours even further and mm. just showing <laughs> people you can have a lot of breeders and you can have a lot of animals and still keep them at quality yeah yeah and awesome. I'm actually considering moving my animals to a substrate instead of paper towel. I'm kind of torn. Do it. Yeah. We've had great I, success with it. 
I know that it's going to be a pain to dig eggs, but it's if, not. I, if I plan on it, if I plan on like, all right, I'm just going to dig the cages once every seven to 10 days or whatever. Yeah. That, that's what I do. If, yeah. if you, okay. if you set it up well enough um, for the breeders, we've done potted, um, potted pothos that, mm. you know, pothos can live in basically straight water. So we fill it yeah. up with water and they won't lay there and they'll lay in the dirt. So we don't have to mm. dig in the roots and we know they're in the dirt and we can watch that a little better. We, we also mound the dirt up towards the back. That way. Yeah, I do that already. I do that on lychees and gargs and saros yeah. and stuff. Yeah. I just haven't historically done cresteds that way. So I'm just yeah. basically going the way of what I've been doing on all the other right. Rachidactylus and Corlophus and Eurodactylodes and stuff and just moving cresteds to it. I've just avoided it this long because, <laughs> because the convenience of a lay box is Well, nice. ju just this past um, summer, I guess, I switched all of our 10 plus gram grow outs to mm. bioactive bins. Yeah. Um, I haven't had a single shedding issue, which yeah. has been yeah. an issue here and there since I moved up here to Tulsa from Shreveport. The, the humidity the swings little, everywhere. It's a little lower. Um, yeah. There's been no shedding issues. They they really like it. So do you just do like cork, plastic plant, and a substrate? I do cork, a substrate, a nice, super thick layer of leaf litter to recreate mm. the forest floor biome. Um, Where are you are you collecting leaves and and? I'm collecting yourself? leaves and baking them, and then stocking it i i use oak okay that's cool do you throw anything else in there like springtails not really um that okay. i i wasn't going to do that until i got them set up into pvc we're ordering pvcs for everything over 10 grams mm -hmm. um okay. i i didn't want to have to throw out the we also have Enough noticed, for... at least in our house, the springtails tend to migrate pretty well. <laughs> yeah, they'll cage. find a way, man. They'll find oh, they'll they find do. their way to every cage. And the yeah. and the powder blues, powder blues just go everywhere. Um, but yeah, they just <laughs> okay. whatever whatever springtails we have, we've never added springtails, but they just keep showing up everywhere. Wow. Okay. Yeah. What uh what soil mix are you guys using? Um. I used to use the ABG mix. It's the best brand on the market. Um, however, using AGB mix for everything is very, very expensive. So I make my own soil mix. It's like 40% mm. uh, cocoa fiber, 30 or so percent uh, hardwood mulch, 20% sphagnum moss and 10% leaf litter. And we just mixed that What was up. the first chunk you cut out? Um, the first 40%? Uh, cocoa what was fiber. That? Cocoa fiber, yeah. So we'll get some cocoa, cocoa fiber, break that up, and then we just add all the other stuff to it. Sometimes if we have charcoal, we'll add charcoal. Um, I, I've been adding it for the last hmm. few times. Yeah. But um, What's the benefit of the charcoal without the insects or without many insects? Yeah. You're smart. I don't, well, you're the one who adds it, so. So basically, <laughs> it's a surface for beneficial bacteria to grow on. I might be butchering it, um, but there's a bacterial benefit of having okay. it in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, it sounds so educated. Yeah, I, I use it in my, I use it <laughs> in my um, house, obviously my house plants, but I haven't thought yeah. about using it in. I mean, it's, I think, I believe it's part of most other soil mixes and the like. I don't really know as more. I think, I think it's that. an ABG. Yeah. So we're kind of just replicating the ABG. Without the tree, the tree fern fiber or the peat moss. Yeah. We're just, we're doing the, we're doing something that's more cost effective. I mean, it's, you can spend all the money you want on your animals. That's fine. But it's, it's, if we can recreate it in bulk then that's that's something that's really helpful and it works really really well we use it on our isopods too they enjoy nice. it um because it's all it's all it's got those chunks of wood and and the leaf litter and all of the good stuff that you'd find out out in the yard nice yeah i i'm intrigued by the bio tubs i tried it on a bunch of animals and they all 
just it was just a disaster so and so i didn't have leaf litter in them but i felt like they literally just like filled the food bowl with dirt and just like painted the walls with dirt and food and i was just like what the heck just happened the the leaf litter is definitely helping there however me personally i wouldn't do bioactive bins again really you'll do paper towel well i'm i'm trying to work away from using bins for anything but my babies okay um I don't like how easily stained the plastic gets from the constant soil contact. Yeah. Um, It is very much an aesthetic reason versus like a viability reason. The viability has been good. It's just, he doesn't like how it looks. That's fair. That's fair. And we can't, I mean, it's harder to grow plants in there because it's harder to get light in, but we're just, we're we're switching to like a 12, inch tall by eight inch wide by 16 inch deep PVC enclosure for like 10 to 30 gram animals. And okay. that, that should fix the very aesthetic reasons. <laughs> plus, plus we will be able to put a uh, full spectrum lighting on them, okay. which yeah. I'm really curious to see how that affects floppy tail syndrome and growth rates. Mm. I think floppy tail is so much about cage decoration too. I think it's. it's... I 100% agree. I I agree. I think there's also a factor of speed of growth as well. Um, also, these animals are just not a like we. There's I've seen breeders that have a lot of animals that hit size very very quickly. Uh-huh. They feed a lot of bugs. They have higher to warmer temperatures or whatever it may be, but they tend to have a more instance of floppy tail. Uh, uh-huh. So getting up to size really, really fast might be part of it. I think it's also just that these animals are not adapted naturally to keep these tails for their life span. Yeah. I yeah. I think that's a huge part of it. And I think that's just, it's just something we've basically modified ourselves because we are yeah. like, we like the tail tails cute. And so they just, it, some of them are going to end up with it no matter how many cage decorations yeah. you put in there. Some of them just want to lay on the side of the cage and just yeah. let their tail fall. They, there's nothing you, like I have a couple breeders that like six, seven years into their life, they just decided this is how I like to sleep now. And there's nothing <laughs> I can do about it. No matter what I add into it, the cage, they don't use it and no. they don't care. Yes. <laughs> The animals are going to do what animals are going to do. Real yeah, it, it doesn't impact them unless it's like, you know, hip distorting right. levels, which I, I've never seen. I mainly get it with males, like like older males that just kind of get yeah. lazy. I don't know. <laughs> there's just enough. There's just enough spine segment behind the hips to yeah. the tail, to the base of the tail that it most of the time there's not going to be any hip issues. It would take a very, very extreme floppy tail. And then there's been one case where I was very concerned about it, but if I remember correctly, like there was x-ray done and it wasn't affecting the hips. Yeah. The x-rays are actually really interesting how, how, where it shows where the hip connection is in relation to the base of the tail. When you actually see the x-rays. That's good to know that most of the time it's not actually impacting negatively. That's cool. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so, you know, now this, I think this has been super helpful. I, I wish we could talk longer. <laughs> it's been good like, though. So many, We're on a roll. I have so many more questions. But I, I feel like if I, I come back on again and ramble on about something. Yeah, of yeah. course. You guys are always welcome. I feel like if I ask more questions, we, we could go all night. We could. Um, we literally but, could. Yeah, we'll have to do it again. Uh, but for, um, you know, final advice for new breeders, um, beginner tips in the hobby as we kind of, uh, uh, end out, um, what are some of your, um, encouragements or tips uh, for new breeders and how to break in, how to, you know, have a profitable side hobby, I, side business. I feel like I say this about once a week. <laughs> yeah. Um, keep it small. Mm. Keep it as high end as you can afford. If you're a kid starting out, yeah. spend that $200 on the nicest animal you can find. Don't just like buy five very mediocre 20, uh, $40 animals. Um, if you're starting out and you're an adult with an adult budget, spend that extra money and go for quality over quantity. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
if you don't step on any toes and you're just a very reasonable person, you will get roots on the hobby very quickly. Mm -hmm. There's no real click that exists if you just like be a decent person, really. (laughs) (laughs) To say hi to people. Asking questions is really good and uh, asking questions with honest intent, like, hey, I really want to know more about this. We see people that will come and ask questions and it doesn't like it's I I don't know how to put it, but it doesn't feel like it's honest intent, if that makes sense. Or they're trying to warm their way in. The the whole cappuccino thing is a perfect example of that. But just people sort of like kind of getting in, being friendly and then kind of nobody in here is out to destroy anybody. We're yeah. we're all just goofy reptile lovers that love their geckos. You stole what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> Great minds, right? But you know, no nobody is completely unapproachable and mm. we're all just out to, you know, breed pretty animals. And so yeah. just reach out and talk and, and be willing to listen. I think the big thing is being willing Money to gets listen. in the way of that a lot. Money does get in the way of that a lot, but being willing to listen is is a key to any relationship in general. But um, making friendships in a hobby of a reptile sort that's very tight knit, yeah, just be honest, be open, ask questions, and and you just know, roll with it. Just roll with it, and roll with it. yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Yeah, I think I think that's been uh, helpful for me. You know, just uh, chatting with people and yeah. Uh, making friends and uh and it's been it's been really good and helpful and just being chill about every everything you know and just uh learning <laughs> being <laughs> humble and learning yeah that's awesome um aj any other final words or questions before we no we i mean out? i'm just this whole conversation has got me excited about the future so yeah. i think just like all the the new things that will come as far as um just really cool animals that are going to appear in the future and I, i'm excited for both of our like evolutions of care too because i think that that's going to be a big um story to tell in the future of just like how we care for these animals and how can and we what, go, how can we go a little bit right. um above and beyond you know yeah. it, with some with some intentional thought for the animals so yeah, i mean yeah i oh. agree some some people uh some feedback from other people that have said oh you know like they they see these videos and kind of um how you guys do things and uh, they actually follow. And I think that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, they actually listen and yeah. So I I will say one last thing to like end on a even brighter note. I feel like the hobby today is so much more positive than it was like, let's say five years ago or 10 years ago. There's a lot more collaborative efforts to help everyone involved. Uh, gotcha. Like, the, the stuff that you're doing with uh, Gabby and Sundown, that simply didn't happen like five years ago. Like collaborating? Yeah, yeah. like it, it was in a less positive light. I've collaborated a lot. My the, the first time I did it was in 2010. It didn't go great. I was still yeah. a child, but you know. <laughs> um, as far but, as like breeding loans and stuff goes, or as far well, as like kind of like... Loans. like um, narrative or like you know social media stuff and i i would say all of the above like the the more that there's interpersonal connections and visual collaboration between people you see a correlation between their values and the values that the other people around them share and it let let's say some perfect example harry like aj is endorsing you so <laughs> i see aj endorsing you and i'm like well shoot aj aj thinks he's good and i trust what aj thinks. <laughs> so harry's probably a really good person <laughs> yeah 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 we're, we're all chill it's all it's good um, yeah, i love it yeah so i i feel like now more more than ever we're seeing a more interconnected hobby yeah and the, the more positive interaction there is, the better, in my opinion. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. the more we collaborate to, the cooler animals we're going to make. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because there's things that, like this year, I've bought a lot of animals. And there's things that, like, regardless of how hard I tried, I couldn't make them in my semi-closed collection. And so I'm super excited to have brought in animals that 
that I could have never made. And now they're kind of opening up new things to me. So yeah. I think that all of that collaboration that we can do or like, you know, loans or trades or any of that stuff to kind of further visions of like, you know, like what you're doing to, with your patterned SuperDAO project. It's like, mm -hmm. all right, there's a few of us who really like this. Let's work together and let's like knock yeah. it out of the park. Kevin has been amazing. Laura at Smugbug has been amazing with mm -hmm. like helping realize this vision mm -hmm. of something that simply doesn't exist, but is very attainable. I think Dana Posey is working on it a little bit. Um, Dana has some. Uh, is Aubrey? Aubrey definitely is. Uh, that's Cow Cowajunga. Yes. Um, and then Dana Posey is Posey's Cresties. Um, and they're all kind of working on the same thing. So hopefully at some point we'll be able to collaborate with them too. Um, mm. and it's just, it's awesome to, you know, build these relationships with people. It's actually, it's a really wonderful community. It's just yeah. getting connected and not, not freaking out because someone is like a big name. Most, we're, most people. No I one mean, cares. <laughs> AJ, I mean, some of our, some of our really like close friends in the hobby are not quote unquote big names and they're mm. great little breeders. They've got like and, 10 geckos and that's all. And they're, yeah. you know, there's, it's, it's not about being a big breeder. It's about being a, a good person, a good person really. Yeah. yeah. And if you're a good person, yeah, good. you'll be welcome no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really good. Even if you make a mistake or two along the way, like it, it's nothing that won't buff out. Mistakes and for happen. new people, being teachable is huge. Like being Absolutely. being humble enough to be able to learn and like, no. oh, somebody yeah. recommended this maybe wasn't a good idea to do. Oh, maybe I should evaluate that decision. Yeah. Or, Humility is a big thing. Yeah. Even even yeah. Yeah. at a quote unquote level <laughs> that we're at, you know, humility is still something that we every once in a while check ourselves and go. You know, there's a lot of room for improvement on this front and we're going to do it. Yeah. yeah. Someone, someone's yeah. mentioned something to us and we're like, oh, OK, let's let's make a shift here. Let's reevaluate. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm huge on community. Yeah. And I think that's what why I'm enjoying, uh, you know, once I jumped in, I was like, oh, there's you know, there's some weird some weird uh, aspects of it. But uh, there's also a lot of good people. And I think that's what makes it so exciting that you're just, we're just all working together. We're all just trying to uh, do do uh, big things together. Right. And so, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Noah and Meredith, man, we appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for taking it was so much of your time. I know you guys, you guys are busy. Um, Thanks for really appreciate that. you guys. Yeah, yeah we, we'll have you guys again sometime. We would love that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> all right, Noah, Meredith, thank you guys. It was good meeting you guys. Thank good you night. both. Bye. Bye.